Extras. Now, Little One's plan of passive resistance was not a bad one on the theory that the Nightmare Realm was a literal dream construct or otherwise pure deception. That's why everyone was on board with it, initially. Of course, the evidence of the extent of Aldrone's domain control shook some of their faith, particularly with the mounting metagame evidence of a lack of obvious or even noticeable behind the GM screen will saves. When the acid dice came out and Little One suffered significant damage, again, with no d20 rolls on his or the GM's part, that was the final nail in the coffin of that idea, for most of them except for Little One himself. He was sure that if everybody was united in doing nothing, the Albtrom would not be able to follow through on dissolving them all. And here's the thing. He was wrong about Al. As described in the video, the demigod would be thrilled if they all just allowed themselves to die when they had been given the easiest and most obvious imaginable way out. It, it's like the opposite of a trap. That would serve Al's purposes and their master perfectly well. But from a metagame perspective, Little One's player was right in the sense that it would be incredibly stupid, unfun, and gut-wrenchingly unsatisfying as human beings IRL to allow the entire party, the entire campaign, to end in such a stupid and meaningless fashion. Whatever ideals you may have about hardcore blah blah, nobody wins if it all ends because of one incorrect assumption about an unknown in a situation where it is quite reasonable for them to see many of their standard assumptions about the world and its logic as not applicable. They were told the area was the plaything of a locally omnipotent asshole who could change things at will and who was stopped from instantly erasing them only by mysterious divine rules. Therefore, the assumption that everything, including the acid, was fake may not have been as likely as the assumption that everything was functionally real, but you would certainly have to give it some reasonable odds. And in the end, if, based on that gamble, the entire party had chosen to die in the acid, believing they would wake up as though from a dream, then it likely would have been preferable for me to rewrite some chunk of what was going on to make that true. Because even if I weren't making a video series, nope, you all chose to die in acid. Would be an incredibly shitty ending to many years of adventuring. Fun fact, we didn't have the miniatures out when they camped out and the ground started burning away. When Draven asked if he was closest to the acid, I just dictated that he was closer to the middle based on their stair climbing formation. But after that, I realized I should roll to see who was closest to the edge. And it was RNG that put little one closest. Hashtag fate. When they left the acid clearing and began navigating the open forest, they picked what should have been the direction of the portal and headed that way. But I cut out one little unimportant exchange. Faced with an ordinary-looking forest, they head in the general direction of the portal, though with little hope that they would actually get any closer. We'll just move ahead in a straight line. After a hundred feet or so, you see a clump of trees up ahead. As you get closer, it seems to be one of those impassable walls of trees, but just a small cluster of it, five feet in diameter. A densely packed clump of trees? But we can just go around. You almost have to, but everything else is pretty wide open, just a tree every five to fifteen feet. Do we go left or right? We go over! Wait, we can't do that in this plane. I got an idea. We do the Scooby-Doo, and we split up. No. Obviously, he put this here for some reason. I love how much thought is already going into this non-obstacle. Let's just go right. Okay, you go around to the right, bypassing the clump. You're starting to see a line of more dense trees up ahead, over a wider area, unlike this random clump, which accomplished nothing beyond preventing you from going in a straight line. Right. Good. 
Now, if you examine the tutorial, aka the first challenge, as it was retroactively designated, it ended up splitting the party pretty nicely into functional units, which were each fairly well equipped for the tasks they were presented with. Little One and Angel's combination of mobility, dark vision, and minion killing powers to handle the zombies, while the main part of the group above featured healing and buffing to counteract the overwhelming area attack, combined with a tank to get up close and tempt the demons into fighting more stupidly, and enough damage dealing to take them down. This may lead you to assume I planned it that way, but you would be... Well, wrong is too strong a word, but you're giving me too much credit. They could have ended up split in a completely different way or stuck together as one big, much safer blob. I just laid out the rules of the encounter in my notes and let them figure it out on their own. The door at the top of the shaft would slam shut when either key fragment was touched. That would also cause the zombies to start coming, dropping down from the upper tunnels via the hole above each of the three chests. And finally, it would unleash the Solomith demons above, though they would have to burn their way through the trees, slowing them down, and giving anyone stuck up above a chance to prepare or flee. The location of the second key fragment would be randomized between the three chests. No clever puzzle to guess the Albtrom's thinking, just pure randomness for the tutorial. The shaft would reopen when the two key fragments were united. So while a small agile team, probably featuring Angel and or Little One because they're both so action-oriented and mobile, was likely to head down and touch the first fragment, that was arguably the most obvious thing to do, but it was also quite likely that the party would go down together, such that some or all of them would already be in the shaft when the first ones grabbed the key part. In that case, most or all of the party would be trapped below, and completely unaware of the demons burning their way into the clearing up above. They would easily handle the zombies, probably tackling more than one lane simultaneously, and if they were all together, unaware of the threat upstairs, one could imagine them even investigating the upper-level hallways, looking for a way to stop the flow of undead. Meanwhile, the Solomiths would clear the trees from their starting point and invade the clearing, spreading out around the stone slab to wait for it to open. Once the key was recombined, the top of the shaft would open, and the demons would ready for anyone to emerge, at which point the first ones out would face a massive soulfire bombardment which would, of course, destroy the top of the rope ladder, dropping anyone unfortunate enough to be relying on it. Side note, this nefarious plan does not require any fault in the ladder itself, and thus no investigation, however intense, would have found anything wrong with it. Maybe an augury. The worst case for the party would probably have been if just one or two of them were trapped up top when the shaft closed. In that case, the seven Solomiths would be way too much, and they would probably go down in flames unless they quickly and firmly decided to flee, either dimension dooring down, or fleeing back through the clearing's entrance. Of course, if I was really mean, and I'd be tempted if it was just one person because they'd have nobody to talk to, I could resolve the two areas one at a time instead of alternating back and forth, so those in the zombie tunnels would have remained blissfully unaware of the demon situation. I've mentioned before that demons, devils, etc., and equally their good-aligned counterparts, angels and other often-skipped sections of the monster manual, have great difficulty breaking into the material planes from their distant hells and heavens. Obviously, as seen in the fiery Solomith fight, that does not hold true within the realm of the Albtrom, because this is, of course, a de facto outpost of hell. Taken together, we can surmise from these facts that fiends can't easily escape from here into the world outside. It is worth noting again that in the cosmology of TDDC, or Deathfin, as I named the setting, even though I named it way late in the game so you may not even remember that, in this universe, Asmodeus rules the Hells, a distant plane that is home to all fiends, demons, devils, Yugoloths if they exist, all that junk, and any of the traditional landmarks of Hell, the Abyss, etc., if those places happen to exist in our world. That doesn't necessarily mean demons and devils are on the same side. I think you can assume they compete just by the fact that they even have different names, despite the fact that ultimately they all serve the god Asmodeus. That's the kind of evil Asmodeus is. All those who serve him suffer, and if they serve him well, they seek to take it out a thousandfold on anyone else. The Solomiths, though they tear faces out of their belly to hurl soul fire blasts, 
don't actually lose the souls that power them. Their tortured energy drifts back to the demons as they fast heal the physical damage. When slain, sure, the souls appear to escape, but here in the realm of the Albtrom, an outpost of hell, those souls all return to their master and tormentor, Asmodeus. If a Solomith had somehow escaped into the outside world and was destroyed there, those souls would be freed, but most would become lost. They're dead and bodiless, with nothing to anchor them, and no home to go to save hell. And though they feel that inexorable pull from beyond the astral sea, many put their entire being, all that is left of them, into resisting that pull, for they know what awaits them. No good can come from this imbalance, which is why Anku's shepherds would seek to find such souls and send them on. But while most probably do go back to hell, some lucky few may not. For when a demon slays a mortal, they harvest that soul for Asmodeus regardless of where it was destined to go. And rituals, like those performed by Rygax, send the lost souls where they truly belong without bias. Little One's One Extreme Challenge was actually an interesting discussion in its own right, but though it wasn't very long, the script was already going long and it flowed better if I cut the details. Draven wasn't a big fan of the idea, as shown, because several smaller challenges felt safer, less risky. But after Little One suggested it, and it was rejected, he explained his logic that whatever the number of challenges, if they were close to winning, the enemy would undoubtedly make the last one as hard as possible regardless. But there are limits to how tough a single fight or puzzle, let's be real, mostly fight, can be, and if the last one is likely to be as hard as possible anyway, Little One's meta logic was that they would save themselves a lot of stress and attrition and end up with the same hard battle they would eventually end up fighting anyway. Which is some pretty tight logic, and probably why the suggestion was rejected by the Alptrom. After the rules were all laid out, Little One, who is always trying to find an outside-the-box solution, even to less unusual situations than this, took another stab at bringing this thing to an early conclusion. If you want to make things interesting, I have an offer for you. I fight Rygax 1v1 to the death, but whoever wins, you send me and all my friends home. Rygax doesn't appear to like this plan. What are you bargaining for? I won't be a party to a murder, but a fight? Rygax can't take me, and at the end of the fight, you send me and all my friends home. Tempting. But I'm sorry, that was a limited time offer, and rule number five says no haggling. Your only way out now is to move forward. You know what I was doing, eh? Yeah, you lose. I lose on purpose. Me and all my friends, he'd have to send my body home because that was part of the deal, even though I'd be dead. And then we raise you. Yeah. No, we can't raise you. Sure you can. You told us little one didn't believe in that and not to raise you if you died. Well, this is different. It's a, it's a trick an asshole half god. Oh... This is how I pictured it in my head. I was going to punch Rygax in the face, <laughs> then say, Rygax is my friend, and let him kill me. Assuming Rygax would do it. Then you raise me after you take me to that crystal thing and let it crush the astral plague out of me, so at least one of us would be free of it. Oh. But you didn't go for it. It was a good try. Now, the party didn't exactly have a lot of choice about the rules dictated by the Altrum. They are theoretically better than nothing, especially with the apparent tweaks made based on the party's concerns. Rule number one is nothing but a bald assertion of dominance. Rule number two at least defines the main way that this demigod will be competing with the heroes. It at least gives them an objective to look for, while there will doubtless be variations that twist the format, but knowing that gives them something to work with. Rule number three theoretically, promises at least some definition of fairness, a cementing of the fuzzy concepts suggested by Rygax that because they were invited into this nightmarish realm, demiplane, whatever, its master has to give them some kind of chance to survive and eventually to escape. Rule number four sets a victory condition and a reward in that the Albtrom 
has more or less guaranteed their safe return home if they complete the given number of challenges. Though that number did change in a way that seems questionable, but which our heroes didn't dare question since clearly the change was in their favor. Rule number five, of course, was right back to assertion of dominance, just in case it wasn't clear enough. Many people have pointed out various flaws in these rules, loopholes big enough to swallow buildings. I actually disagree with a lot of the particular concerns raised in the comments, but the ultimate point is correct. The rules are a lot more like guidelines. In particular, if the common legal principle of lex specialis derogat legi generali were to apply, that is to say, roughly, a specific law takes precedence over a more general law, then all these rules mean nothing since Al could just keep adding new specific rules or clauses which effectively invalidate the existing ones. To make a specious yet terrifying example, Rule 3F. There is always a way out, except on Tuesdays. And even if the Albdrome stuck to the general spirit of these rules, there's nothing forcing him to present them with the challenges they require to win. There's no limitation on how much time can pass between challenges or what dangers they may face in between. In the end, it all comes back to the hope that there are some strange, possibly unknowable divine rules which bind the Albtrom's actions, not just to obey their own self-serving rules, but some kind of more fundamental protections as well, like D&D's challenge rating system, which itself has a dangerous amount of fuzziness and leeway, but that's another story, or the possibility that my friends kick me out IRL if Al screws with them too much or too hard between challenges. Fun fact, I was really torn on how to script Albtrom's response to Draven's concern about changing existing rules. I remembered it as interesting. Done and I like how that sounded, and eventually went that way. But when I checked the recording and my notes, the original version was the equally good, interesting. Stipulated. He looks over at little one. That means I don't contest the point. Dunn had the advantage of simplicity, though, and the punchiness with which they could deliver that word. My supporters on Patreon get extras videos about a week early so that I can answer a bunch of their questions in the final videos using completely arbitrary voices. Last time I said no Albtrom questions, but we've had at least one episode with them now, so let's see what was asked and what I could answer without spoilers. William Bailey asked, Just how sick of the potty shit is Rygax at this point? They have to be the most insane and infuriating people he's ever had to put up with, right? They are frustrating, but I don't think they've done that much that is insane, certainly not enough to overcome the competence and valor they displayed in defeating Todd, Kaiser, and slaying Baron Deathmoor, preventing a full-fledged Deathmoor for another century. And Rygax has become pretty chill in his many decades, maybe multiple centuries, of adventuring in the Fell, pretty accustomed to dealing with strange creatures. Perhaps in his youth, before he became an expert in dealing with spirits and cryptids, he may have had less patience for these rather aggressive Shadowfell newbies. Demon Nachos asked, What would have happened if the party had used some gimmick, a mage hand, a trick arrow, or some other means, to grab the first part of the key? Would the slab door still trigger, locking him out of the shaft? Would the slab retract if the key piece was dropped, or would they be forced to dimension door down below? Mage Hand wouldn't work, because the keys count as magical, at least for that purpose. They could have gained a little information using other means, like Unseen Servants, Telekinesis, etc., but Al would have blocked anything that would outright break the challenge. So, if, for example, they cast Telekinesis to grab the key fragment, I would have had it start to work, pick up the piece, just enough to slam shut the stone slab, but then the spell would be cut off and fail as it lost line of effect, immediately dropping the key fragment and resetting, reopening, the slab. So they would have learned what would cut off the underground area, but they'd still have to send someone down to get it. A summoned creature wouldn't be cancelled or dispelled, but they'd be cut off from it and unable to give new orders, and presumably its duration would expire or it would eventually be slain by the endless zombies and negative energy patches, either way dropping the key part, which would cause the slab to reopen. 
But in any case, most of these would have been fairly arbitrary on-the-spot decisions. If they complained or something, Al could always show up and taunt them about it. Aaron Van Diesel asked, Can you give more details on how natural portals work? We know some are seasonal, time of day, etc., but others must be always open, right? In particular, if there is a natural portal to the Fadelands in the Aldrome's realm, do people keep wandering into it by accident and being sent straight to hell? The reason I'm so fuzzy on natural portals is that they vary so much. There's probably one somewhere that's just a little cave, like a little cave a bear might hide in, that is always open. Or there may be a mountain peak that opens to the Feywild at first light every morning. Or there might just be some plain glacial rock sticking out of a farmer's field in Verandi, where if there's a lightning storm covering a full moon, anyone standing on that stone crosses over to the Shadowfell. And should some unfortunate soul manage to do so, that path is opened in both directions until dawn. You know, standard stuff. But while a door opens from both sides, it's safe to assume that any natural portal does work in both directions, does not necessarily open in the same way, time, or with equal ease from both sides. Like the glacial rock example above, sometimes the portal only opens from one side, but when someone passes through it, that would temporarily open it to traffic from the other side. So it's unknown at this point whether the portal they have pinned their hopes on opens from the Fadeland's side at all, though if it does, it's a fair bet some people have wandered in over the years, never to return. Dimon asked, With the difficulty of breaking into the material plane in Deathfinna, how often would a cult be able to make a fiendish pact, or would an angel send a hero on a quest? Have you ever regretted making it hard to include classic enemies like, like uh, demons and devils? Actually getting across? Very hard. Getting messages into the minds of a few receptive mortals? Happens much more often than you think. Amara, goddess of heaven, is known as the dream, and Asmodeus, the nightmare. Many portals see glimpses of the outer realms themselves, among other visions, on a nightly basis, though most often what they see is forgotten when they wake. Sometimes, though, the messages do get through, or at least strange symbols and omens which mortals may choose to follow or may just ignore. So there are probably always individuals in cults seeking forbidden knowledge of the hells, perhaps leading to a pact or even a full-blown summoning, and doubtless there are always heroes being guided by angelic visions. But do I regret the limitation? Nah. There are infinite enemy options, and it means that if or when I do bring them in, it can be a little jarring and make you wonder if it's an indication of something more important going on behind the scenes. Except in the realm of Alptrom, it's basically hell, so he can whip out demons if he wants. Esed Benal and Nine ask, Given that Amara and Asmodeus and Asmodeus seem to have a mirror image theme going on, does Amara have some lieutenant with an Albtrome style outpost? Presumably in the Feywild. Yeah, presumably. It's reasonable to assume that if Asmodeus was able to swing this rather nasty patch of territory, Amara may have managed something similar. But I think it's a mistake to assume that it would be such a predictable mirror image. Who knows what the dream equivalent of the Albtrom might be, or what they might do, given that Heaven isn't really interested in stealing souls which are rightfully bound for the Hells. Nine also asked, I assume that the zombies that Al has are just shadow-filled zombies. I assume. But could they actually stop zombies from being made in their realm? The Albtrom's degree of local omnipotence could absolutely get rid of all the corpses from their lands, or, since that would be a waste, could just concentrate all those bodies into one convenient spot for later... use. Joe Richter asked, How long was the party trapped in the Shadowfell IRL? Also, when did the players become aware that you were making a video series of the campaign? We weren't playing anywhere near every week during the Week of Hell period for various reasons, but 
Part of the fun of nicknaming it the Week of Hell is that in reality, this week of in-game time took place over the span of well over a year IRL. I've been making TDDC seemingly forever now. I don't remember where the party was at that point in time. Um, end of 2012, I think? But I know I was making the Ginneron episodes right around when the party was meeting TR4, so there was a bit of a cyclical feel for Polaron. It helped refresh their memory of the older events, that's for sure. Well, I never get nearly as much done as I want to, including the main TDDC videos, let alone other stuff, but I did finally finish converting another gaming comic from the archaic format. Loremaster patrons can download the full series PDF, including creator commentary, while I'll keep releasing one a day on the website until it reaches the end sometime next year. I still have to convert the old D&D excerpts before the content on demonact.com is back up to everything the old site used to have, but at least I'm making progress. Based on a poll of patrons, I tried to draw Toph from The Last Airbender and Shredder from TMNT in the last art stream, so check that out if you missed it. I do a stream about once a month, sometimes art, sometimes lore, and I'll try to warn you in advance on Twitter, Discord, etc. when I schedule one. If you catch it live, you can ask questions in chat, but if not, you can at least watch it at 1.5 times speed or whatever, which is nice. Thanks again to all my patrons for your essential support, with a special shout out to Aether Mordu, Aurelius, Oust, Bedemir, Bigrin, Carlin, Critical Hit 20, Dimmin, Duckburg, Duskmar, Earl of Sanguine, Yuffie, Fay Crossroads, Fireborn, Fright Knight, Gorefiend, Hakun, Havoc, Nine, John, Lieutenant Red, Lonito, Lord Aben, Mad Brewer Zack, Malison Desh, MG3D, Norgrin, OI1, Olden Man, Pedrick of Rooney, Pontus Prism Cat, Ramar Ulfis, Repmock, Stan the Man, Skyter 97, Starfall, Surf USA, Sygax, Sildari, Toshiro 7, Tembu in June, Valis, Volkfang, W.A. Soul, Warsaw, Zombie, Woodley, the members of the organization. Uh.